This morning we're looking at Luke chapter 16, uh, verses 1 through 13. Earthly finances with an eternal focus. A classical back there. Great. Let's begin reading Luke chapter 16, 1 through 13. Now he was also saying to the disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And the steward was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. And the steward said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I'm not strong enough to dig. Ashamed to beg, I know what I should do, so that when I am removed from the stewardship, they will receive me to their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. And his master praised the unrighteous steward because he acted shrewdly for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness. And when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little is also unrighteous in much. <coughs> if therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give that you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Of the nearly 40 parables in the Gospels, about a third of them in some way deal with money. Now since money played a dominant role in society and in people's lives, as it does in our own culture today, it's no big surprise that Jesus taught a lot about money. It's no secret that people, you and me, spend a lot of our time thinking about money. How to get it, how to spend it, how to save it, how to invest it, how to borrow it, how to pay it back, how to give it away to whom and to what charity. Money can create in people's minds all kinds of issues. Anxiety, depression, selfishness, greediness, pride, and even idolatry. Just a quick overview of what the Bible reveals about money. How to obtain it through work, Scripture says in Proverbs 14, 23. In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. The Apostle Paul taught that those who refuse to work should not eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 Money can be obtained by saving for the future. Solomon wrote, There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man swallows it up. Proverbs 21 verse 20 Money can be obtained through proper assessment of one's own resources and, and planning. Proverbs 27, verse 23 and 24 says, Know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. And money can be obtained through gifts. Uh, Apostle Paul mentioned several times in Philippians that he's received these gifts and he thanks people because they're providing for his needs. Well, on the other hand, there are wrong ways to get money. Stealing it, fraud, change of 
exorbitant interest, charging exorbitant interest on things, and cheating people what's due to them. And the scripture reveals in a right way and a wrong way for dealing with money. There are those who love it. And they're warned of, of that path that leads to destruction in the scripture. There are many examples of that. Achan, Balaam, Judas, Ananias, and Sapphira, just to name a few. And the, they suffered the consequences of their love for money. The Bible supports the proper use of money. Supporting themselves, the scripture says. Providing for their families. 1 Timothy 5, 8. Supporting the nation. That's where the old taxes come in. We're required to pay our taxes. Render your Caesar, Jesus said, the things that are Caesar's and the things that are God give to God. And taking care of other people, people in need, the sick, the homeless, the helpless, the blind. James 2 talks about that. Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, he addressed that. And above all these biblical prerequisites for the kingdom of God, to honor God. To honor God in our giving. Owing no man anything, the scripture says. Paying our bills. Eliminating non-essential spending so that we can get out of debt. Refusing to borrow money for our luxuries. Our giving to the Lord is entirely voluntary. 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 9, verse 7. It's all voluntary. But he says to give cheerfully, joyfully, willingly. Not grudgingly, eagerly, out of love. A church in, in uh, Missouri one time during the offering was given, somebody played this laughing tape. <laughs> the elders didn't really much get into that, but uh, the whole point was you need to give cheerfully. Give as you're having a good time. The scripture says God loves a cheerful giver. In our text today, Jesus shares another parable. This one is about, you guessed it, our attitudes and his will when it comes to wealth, concerning wealth. Look again at verse 1 through 8. Now I was saying to the disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and this steward was reported to have squandered his possessions. Here our Lord tells a story from the expected and the unexpected experiences of life. The main character is a unrighteous manager. And he's guilty of not only incompetence, but of embezzlement. And our Lord created him in this story, this parable, to teach us a very positive spiritual truth. His point was that if an unrighteous man was clever enough to use money for his own selfish interests, how much more should righteous believers use all of that as they possess for the kingdom of God, to head for that kingdom? And notice this parable he's addressing to the disciples, not the scribes and Pharisees as other parables, but he's talking to his disciples. This rich man was wealthy, obviously wealthy enough to be able to hire a manager to run his stuff. And so apparently one of the tenants informed the owner that, hey, your manager is, uh, he's not giving you everything. He's keeping something. He's cheating. And so the owner calls him and does this confrontation to protect his interest, and he fires him. He fires him. But before he fires him, notice that he lets him get things in order. He gives him enough time to get the books in order, and then you're done. And then this dishonest manager realizes, hey, wait a minute, uh, this isn't going to work. I'm too weak to dig, in other words, to work for a living, and I'm too proud to beg, so what am I going to do? Ah, oh, i got an idea. He gets all those together who owe money to the boss, and he begins to talk to them about how much do you owe, how much do you owe, and he begins reducing their debt. Did you notice that? A hundred measures of oil, now you only owe 50. A hundred measures of oil in this period of history would be equivalent to 875 gallons of olive oil. More than three years' wages. And so he's reduced it in half. And the other guy owes a hundred measures of wheat. 
and he lowers that to 80 majors a week. That's between 8 and 10 years wages, this 100 majors a week. Why is he doing this? Can you see why he's doing it? He was winning. He was winning these debtors friendship. Hey, guys, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You lower, I'm going to lower this a little bit and tell the boss this is all you owe. And look, I'm helping you. He wasn't doing this for the owner's favor, was he? He was doing it for his own. I'm going to have a new people to take care of me. These guys that owe the boss money, and now that I've lowered their bill, they're going to take care of me. In a manner of speaking, now they really owe him. And the real shocker in this is that the owner praised the crooked manager. Do you get that? Maybe that's how he made his money. We don't know. We, we hard to say, but at least he thanked him for being shrewd. You acted shrewdly, wisely. This manager took advantage of the opportunity while he still could. And if all these debtors would take care of him now, after all, he's fired, but he took care of them before he quit. They got fired. What's Jesus' point? He says, for the sins, the sons of this age, sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. What's he saying? In other words, sinners are more skilled and diligent in securing their future on this earth than those whose citizenship is in heaven, where eternal security is going to be forever and ever. True believers should be far more wise in preparing for eternity than they are, is what Jesus is saying. And then look at 9 through 13 here. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. <laughs> he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much, and he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, who will entrust true riches to you? He gives really three reasons or lessons about believers' attitude toward money. The first one applies to others, then to themselves, and to God. To others. Jesus has exhorted his hearers to make friends for themselves by means of the wealth of the unrighteous, so-called. Because it belongs to this passing world. Everything on this world is passing away, amen? Nothing you and I store here is going to be here, is it? It's going to be gone. Unbelievers <laughs> like the unrighteous manager are using money to buy earthly friends. Believers, on the other hand, are to use money to evangelize and purchase heavenly friends. Here is this investing in eternity. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. <clears throat> so where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? And then he talks about themselves. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Some claim, and you've heard it, and I've heard it, if I just had more money... <coughs> If I just had more money, then I could give more here. I could do more of this. I could help more people. If God would just give me more money. <clears throat> but the truth is that character, not circumstances, determines our faith. <laughs> Remember what the poor widow gave? She gave it all. Everything she had. And Jesus said she'll be blessed because of her gift. The issue is not our finances. It's integrity. Integrity, seriously trusting in the Lord. Those who are faithful in a very little thing will be faithful if they had more? <coughs> no, they won't. They had their view of the money in relation to God. Look at here in verse 13. No servant. How many? None. 
No servant can serve two masters, for either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon or money. You can't do it. What's Jesus talking about? No servant can serve two masters. The word that's used there for serve, this is interesting, is slave. No servant, no slave can serve two masters. You're going to serve the one and despise the other. You're going to love one and hate the other. A slave, what are we slaves to? <coughs> now, it's hard for us to get our minds around that because I've never been a slave. Literally. But maybe I have. Have I been a slave to money? Have you been a slave to money? Where money's calling all the shots. Where money determines everything you do or you don't do. Money. A slave. You cannot serve God and money or wealth. So the question for us is, for me and you, who owns you? Who owns you? Who owns you? Our character as disciples of Jesus Christ, as his kids, as his chosen generation, the scripture says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It should be so obvious as night is from day. Who owns you? It should be so obvious. The difference between Christian and a worldly person. It should be so obvious as sheep as the wolves. As heaven is to hell. But in our world today, we nah, we got to mix it together. Got to be a little good, a little bad. As a child of God, we are immune from the commands of Satan. Yeah, he speaks to you. He speaks to me too. We don't have to listen to him. When we pray, he flees. He runs the ship. He can't stand it when we call to God. The power of prayer. Do we use that with our finances? He's the prince of power of air, the scripture says. But we are immune to him as God's kids. And I know people in this world who say we must keep up appearances. Swim with the tide, David. Get on the same boat. Move with the crowd. We're all going in the same direction. Serve money and love God half-heartedly. Everybody's doing it. Not true. That is not true. It's not true. Our real commerce or treasure is in heaven. It's not here. This is stuff. Our time on this planet is we're aliens. And the scripture calls us that. We're aliens in a Strange land. And I know you get this picture in your mind like I do a Star Trek. <laughs> you know, weird, weird, weird. Well, okay, we're weird. We're weird. <laughs> As Christians, we're weird. It's not about staying here and living here and being here for this is not our home. We're passing through. Our citizenship is in heaven. He's prepared a place for you there. Okay, i got to make a down payment on the house in heaven. God's already done that. So who owns you? Spiritually speaking, who owns you? This world is not your home. Christ is coming back. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm ready. Are you? Ready. So are you laying up treasure in heaven? Our Lord has many banks, many banks. The bank of serving him obediently, that's a bank. What do we put in that bank of serving him obediently? The bank of serving others as unto the Lord. What about relationships? What are you putting in that bank of relationships? Serving others as to the Lord. Even your boss at work, are you serving him as to the Lord? What about the bank of evangelism? Telling others about Christ's love. 
purchased with his own blood. While we were sinners, he died for us. He didn't wait later. He died for us when we were sinners. What are you putting in that bank of evangelism? Who are you talking to about Jesus? What about the bank of helping the poor and the needy? Oh, that's more visible. Yeah, we can see that. What are you putting in that bank? What about the bank of giving? What are you putting in that? I know the scripture says 10%. Well, that was the Old Testament times. Now it's up to you. That was a minimum. And it ended up being a lot more than 10%. 10% to this, 10% to that. It was over 25%. If we recapture in our minds, I like what Justin said about our imagination. Maybe today. If we got up every morning thinking, maybe today he's coming back. Today. Maybe he's coming back today. Would that change anything about what you're doing, thinking, feeling? Living with that major premise every day, surely it would motivate us to love more. To love more. It could be today. It could be today. And use what God has provided for us today. To show that we love him to somebody else. And for those of you who haven't yet repented of your sins and asked Jesus to come into your heart, please receive him today. Because unless we repent, scripture says you're not going to be with him in heaven. You're going to be in hell forever. Let's pray. Lord, we're so mindful. Of finances. There's not an individual in this room, even little children, who's not touched by that in some way at Christmas or birthdays or how we use those finances, how you provide for us, how we pay our taxes, how all of that, you're, you're, it's in your bank. How we show others that we are different from the world, that we're not like everybody else. Yeah, we're aliens. And maybe we resent that at first thinking about it, but the truth is, we, this is not our home. We're just passing through. And we want to leave this earthly home building up treasure in heaven of kindness and love and compassion, understanding, forgiveness, helping others who can't help themselves ministering to the, the body of Christ, the, the other sheep that's outside this building that doesn't even know you yet. Help us to add to that bank in our banking system, your banking system, of compassion and love. Lord, we love you. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for the times when we wanted to blend in. We want to look good instead of standing true for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The invitation in this morning is so 265. 265, first and last verse. Let's stand together.